In the video game industry, mergers and acquisitions are often worth billions of dollars and are immeasurable in terms of online buzz. 2022 began with several large-scale acquisitions surpassing $33.6 billion across 665 transactions. This doesn't take into account Microsoft's blockbuster acquisition of Activision for $68.7 billion all cash. The deal is expected to close in summer 2023. Why the big investments into the video game industry? This is what we're going to talk about in today's video. There are many reasons for tech and gaming companies to acquire a large slice of the gaming pie. For example, buying a company with a known track record or speciality can enable the buyer to enter the market segment without prior experience. The biggest examples of this approach are found in the mobile and social game segment. Activision Blizzard's 2016 purchase of Candy Crush uh, and more recently, Take-Two's buying of Zynga. Control of popular gaming titles and entire franchises and of course the corresponding user base are an attractive prospect for buyers. Buying a pre-existing audience is always easier to monetize than one that you must build. Swedish gaming giant Embracer Group is a prime example of a company that owns many studios and subsequently many, many games. The Embracer Group owns a total of 126 small to medium tier development studios and had approximately 160 games in their development pipeline. This strategy is similarly pursued by Chinese digital tech giant Tencent and represents a stark contrast from EA or Activision who mostly focus their attention on major blockbuster series like FIFA, Madden, or Call of Duty. By increasing their potential audiences through strategic acquisitions, gaming companies are also able to increase their respective market share in revenue while removing competitors from the field or putting up obstacles in terms of exclusivity agreements. Let's talk a little bit about the gaming industry and the metaverse. So Microsoft's 68.7 billion acquisition of Activision was several times bigger than the company's profits. Why? Analysts claim that the inbuilt audience of Activision is a stepping stone in Microsoft's metaverse ambition. The metaverse is projected to play a major role in the future of internet usage for gamers. Many aspects of the metaverse are nothing new for the gaming community. Online communities have come together in-game for non-gaming activities for years. Just like major players entering the mobile gaming space by acquiring top mobile gaming companies a few years ago, the metaverse is the latest hot fan of gaming. In claiming a significant chunk of the consumer side, Microsoft is aiming to bolster its upcoming foray in the business side of the metaverse by already having an audience ready and waiting to go. This was more the business side of the gaming industry. What about the consumer side? What about us as gamers? Well, a lot has changed if you realize that big blockbuster games are no longer the norm. Today, a lot of companies are moving towards a freemium model, so the game itself is free to play. And then there's a bunch of microtransactions. Fortnite was definitely one of the trailblazers that changed the paradigm, and a lot of companies and a lot of blockbuster names have followed. The idea behind these microtransactions is that because the game in itself is free to play, it's easier to get a user base engaged. You get more users, and then you monetize the users. I think I think the gaming industry learned a lot from the SAS industry and the tech industry, where a lot of companies will give you something for free to bring you in as a user, and then they'll start working to monetize that user base. A funnel approach, traffic, conversion to user, then conversion to paid user. This model has existed for a while in the tech industry, and the gaming industry has caught up, understanding that once you get your user base engaged into your game, then it's easier to monetize, rather than asking for a $60 upfront commitment from somebody who hasn't even played the game yet. But even in the microtransaction era, the lifetime value for a user is much, much larger than the 60% that you were paying up front. You buy FIFA 2018 for 60 bucks, then you wait for 2019, then you buy another 60, or you don't. You might wait until 2020. So every two or three years, you'll have to buy something the next FIFA. But on average, if you buy FIFA every two years, that comes down to only $30 a year per 
user. Whereas with microtransactions, these numbers can get up to $200, $250 a year because when they're buying something, they're getting value for it at that moment in the game. Instant gratification. This, of course, has a negative effect as we call it free to play, pay to win. If you're paying for certain loot, an awesome gun in Fortnite, for example, or a certain armor piece, then you are more likely to win. Paying gives you an edge in the game. Let's talk a little bit about how these user bases are monetized. I'm an avid Destiny 2 player and have more insight into how that game operates, but the model is relevant for most blockbuster names like Call of Duty or Fortnite. So all of these fall under the MMORPG Looter Shooter Gaming category. MMORPG means Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Games. MMO, because you're playing online and with a bunch of other people. And RPG, because the abilities that your character has in-game is different than somebody else's. And Looter Shooter, because you shoot, you win, and you get loot. What's the business model? How does Destiny 2 make money? What is the science behind the gaming industry? There are two key elements to the model. Number one, the game is a live service game. And number two, the almighty RNG. A live service game means that the game itself is constantly evolving, but the key architecture and physics or the engine of the game remains the same. Once you've installed it, it's already on your console or your PC. After that, it's all updates, new features, hotfixes, patches, DLCs, new content, etc. So just like you have an app on your phone, every once in a while your app will update and the interface will get a change or you get some new features, the same happens in the game. Except for the game, it's not just a feature, it's also content. This is relevant because they're able to keep the same physics engine, so there's not a big rewrite of the architecture. It's mainly about adding content. Destiny 2 initially launched in 2017, and five years later today, there's no necessity for Destiny 3. Whereas with static games, a new version needs to launch every year. FIFA 19, FIFA 20, FIFA 21, 22, etc. Now, we're going to get a little bit more scientific and talk about the second key element of the business model, the so-called RNG God. RNG stands for Random Number Generator. In order to easily explain what an RNG does, I'll use a dice as an example. A dice has six sides, each side with a number. One, two, three, four, five, six. So when you roll the dice, you have an equal chance of landing of any of the six numbers. Now let's say each number is pre-assigned to a certain loot in the game. For example, numbers 1, 2, 3 are assigned to common loot, numbers 4 and 5 are assigned to rare loot, and number 6 is assigned to legendary loot. So every time you roll the dice, you have a 50% chance of getting common loot, 33% chance of getting rare loot, and 17% chance of getting legendary loot. Every time you complete an objective in the game, you kill a boss for example, you receive the right to roll the dice and get the corresponding loot. If you want that specific legendary item, then you need to replay that same objective as many times as required for you to roll the 6. This is the basics of the RNG looter shooter system. Video games have become highly addictive mainly because of this RNG system. In the 1980s and 90s, video games were about technical skills and problem solving. If you could beat level 8-4 in Mario, you were good. You also felt a sense of accomplishment simply by beating the game. With RNG, the sense of accomplishment doesn't actually come from the gameplay itself, but with the loot you receive at the end. We are no longer playing to free the princess, but we are playing and replaying the same objective until the RNG drops the loot we want. This is where things get a little bit controversial. RNG engines have been used in gambling, specifically in slot machines, for decades. It's the same system. You pay a dollar to roll the dice. If the dice lands on one, two, or three, you get nothing. If it lands on four or five, you get two dollars. If it lands on six, you get ten dollars. Every time you push the button on a slot machine, you are generating a random number and are receiving the corresponding cash prize. A lot of people argue that RNG-based video games are becoming too similar to gambling. The euphoria you feel 
when after weeks of grinding the same objective in a game, the coveted loot drops is the same euphoria you feel when you win big on a slot machine. This is where the addictive nature of these video games come from. If you watch YouTube videos of people winning big in online slot machines, how they scream with joy, and you compare it with video game streams of gamers screaming with joy when the loot they want drops, you can clearly see the same emotional response. With the metaverse on its way and video game companies understanding the added value of it, we can only imagine Imagine the potency of emotions that will be delivered to us. Thank you for watching the episode. If you like what you see, please help us out and subscribe. See you next week.